and, and they were the other. Um, not that everybody agrees about this, but sometimes philosophers make a distinction when they talk about emotions and um, some of them think that fear is an emotion that has also a cognitive component uh, because in order to fear something you have to have the belief that uh, something is threatening you. Uh, but uh, in the case of pain, uh, sometimes they speak about pain as an emotion because the, precisely because there is no such a cognitive component where you just have damage uh, in some part of your body and then you experience pain, it's kind of automatic. So I was wondering, for the part that concerns um, the, the study of fear, whether you had ways of distinguishing between you know, state of alert, uh, tendency to get uh, excited about things, uh, in, in, even in a negative way, I mean, and fear in the sense that the animal is actually afraid of something that is expected to happen. So very, very good points. Thank you. So I'm afraid I don't have all the answers to your questions, but I can, you know, report my thoughts about it. So, fear, of course, can be a temperamental trait, can have some genetic components, especially in prey animals, and of course it has a learned part, and in, it is so difficult to investigate how much is learned, how much, for instance, is also about anxiety, and not only fear, in, in these studies. Uh, because you have to think that we are not dealing with laboratory animals that you keep in very controlled environmental conditions. We are dealing with animals that have a life expectancy of 20, 30 years and you come at a certain point of their life. And so from my, you know, my scientific soul would really love to control for everything. But at the other hand, I have also the doubt that controlling everything would not give me much more significant results than looking at the real world and how they react. So, to conclude about the fear study, what we investigated was a fear reaction and with, from these results I cannot infer, well, infer if it is how much is learned, how much is a real emotion, I cannot tell it. Um, so what, about kind of, what kind of stimulus? I missed it. What kind of stimulus? I didn't tell. So it was a novel object, so an object that they never met before. So it was a simple bottle full of small stones dropping in front of them. So. What we found is that the time they needed to come back to investigate the object was significantly related to the temperamental description of the owners before the experiment, but it was also related to the level of increase in their eye temperature. So this, this is what it is. And, uh, you cannot say if it is more because they learned before, because it is more temperamental. And about pain, in somehow science uh, helps us in this. And today we have many interesting studies um, that shows clearly that pain has a very strong emotional component. One of these studies, for instance, is very recent. It was published in 2015 and it was done in humans, not in animals. But so they had humans and um, uh, they selected a population of humans that were abandoned by the beloved one in the last over the last year, and then they um, you know they explained the experiment to these people, and then they inflicted them some physical pain while uh, studying their fMRI, so investigating what their cortex was what was happening in their cortex. And then they showed them the picture of the beloved one that abandoned them. 
and they found that the areas in the brain that were you know, alerted, that were in function, were exactly the same. And this is, of course, has some appeal for scientists, but we don't need to be scientists. If you think about simply language, how it hurts to be abandoned by someone. So we today know that from many, many perspectives, I don't know philosophical, but language perspective, but also scientific perspective, we know that pain has a strong, strong emotional component. So what was the story? They, they felt the pain uh, yeah. on the needle? Yeah. And they were confronted with the picture of the fiancé that abandoned them and the areas of the brain that were activated were exactly the same. Oh, I see. Uh, it hurts uh, being abandoned. Okay. Yes, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. and you, you to... One and then the other. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is not a question for you, it's a, it's a general comment about the conference. Um, we're, we're here to talk about uh, empathy in the context of animal welfare. And um, I'm just, uh, I'm a little bit, one of the things we haven't talked about at all, I'm quite, I'm quite surprised, is the implications of the findings that we have for our practice and policy with regard to increasing and enhancing the welfare rates. We just seem not to have addressed it. And I'm particularly concerned uh, that some of the, some of the, like you said, thinking in philosophy is not emotion. That, that uh, it's visual discrimination, you're not sure yet. It's, I'm just concerned that we're going to stay there and it will just keep going and we'll never say it's pain and we should do something about it. Are you proposing that we organize another workshop? Yeah, no, I just, I just want to put that on the table. That, that, yes, you know, a, a child psychologist who studies the development of a child is very interested in improving the welfare of a child and speaks out on that. And I'm, just, I'm just wondering how comfortable people feel with the investigator or scientist advocacy role as part of their identity. Yeah, unless there's someone who wants to comment on this one. Um, there's a question you know, right now. I wanted to go back to the question of whether fear uh, has a, a emotional and a cognitive component, whereas pain doesn't. Pain has a lot of cognitive component. It's not it's exactly like fear, and uh, there is a lot of work about the one in the title from um, Michaela. On Roman, there is a lot of work which tells you about uh, how expectancies are, think about the touching effect and um, this kind of stuff. And there, is, there are a lot of studies showing that the uh, cognitive component is extremely big and personality traits are extremely big and slightly compared to depression and an effect uh, on, uh, on pain and what you know about pain, what is expect about pain, what's the goal of pain, what is pain for. So I think there is a lot of work on you. I don't know anymore if you know about that, but I think that maybe something is present in, in dogs as well, that there is so. Uh, it's difficult, what I think is very difficult to discriminate between effective and cognitive. I, I think there is nothing having just a cognitive component without an effective one when you talk about uh, emotion. Well, I mean, perhaps mm -hmm. though, with the kind of stimulant that she was considered, the pain because of castration, I mean, it's slightly... Yeah, but, but painful stimulus, it's just going up to the brain, but the brain in back, uh, is uh, acting back uh, on the, the bottom-up way <coughs> controlled by the top-down mechanism. And the top-down mechanism is uh, what you know about, what you expect. There are a lot of studies. Uh, you're telling me that the horse, the 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 horse uh, has different uh, kind of, kinds of pain according to what he knows about uh, when he gets castrated? Well, it's the same yeah. But it has, but there is, there is an affective part of pain. So I define pain as a sensation and a feeling. The definition of pain includes the word feeling, as far as I'm concerned. Part of, part of pain is a feeling. 
And when you have that feeling, it's using high level processing in the brain. It's, that, that's, that's all we need to say. It does involve high level processing, and that is the feeling component of the pain. For instance, there are some other studies proving that you know, the association between pain and data stimulus is in horses is extremely powerful it's for between pain and, and other stimuli. For instance, if a horse is feeling a painful stimulus while you are wearing, for instance, a green jacket, the horse will learn so quickly and for the entire life to avoid green jackets because of the association. So especially in prey animals, the association between pain and other stimuli in learning is tremendous. It is, it is a, a lifetime efficacy. Other, so it questions? Doesn't... other questions? Yes? I have a follow up on Ken's uh, and that is what we were talking about. You said that uh, your studies were funded by the new animal lab. And I was wondering uh, if uh, this very important indicator in that is actually going to be used uh, in order, for example, to avoid certain common practices which certainly will, would, uh, would uh, come out as two other indicators scale, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I was too parsimonious in this <laughs> story about that because my, my shyest part of personality played the role there. But perhaps Don Broom, you know, he's in a good position to talk about that too. But as a matter of fact, uh, one characteristic of these uh, research project is exactly this one. So to accelerate the dissemination of results through learning objects, uh, e-learning methods, applications, and make all of them freely available on a hub so where everybody in the world can download these small and easy to use pieces of information, so translated in, in, in an easy to use language, and hopefully it will, our results will be used to enforce the application of legislation about animal welfare. So we have very good animal welfare legislation in Europe, but one of the problems is that the way this legislation is enforced is different in different European areas, probably as a result of different training and different education possibilities. So, these sort of results, finding new indicators that are objective and can be easily trained, are working exactly towards the direction of improving animal welfare through a better enforcement also of legislation. I don't know if Don you want to add. Well, if, if, you go, if you go to animal welfare indicators, one word from the internet, you will find the animal welfare hub. And uh, there, there is information about this. This is one example. There are about 30 animal welfare indicators which are uh, described there. Uh, and this, so this is information which is already uh, available to anybody in the world. And this particular one uh, has been made into an app which you can download onto your phone. And how many people have done it already? Hundreds and hundreds of people have know. taken this down. Do you, so you back there, do you do you have a figure of so how many people? I think it were more than one. So it was out about six months ago, and we have more than 1,000 downloads in the, in the meanwhile. So when information is available and perhaps also easy to use, people enjoy it and, and use it.